Oh, porque la pasé. So we're going to start. Uh, welcome everybody. Our first speaker will be Juan Carlos de las Reyes from Modemat, Escuela Politécnica Nacional from Ecuador, who will present the work The Level Learning for Inverse Problems. This is a joint work with David Ishafi from Modemat, Escuela Politécnica Nacional from Ecuador. So if you're ready. Um, sure, let me share everything. So I guess you can see right now the slides, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers uh, for the invitation to, to give this, uh, this talk here. Uh, Indeed, uh, I'm talking about bi-level learning for inverse problems, and uh, this is uh, kind of uh, some joint work uh, of the last years, actually, uh, with many collaborators. Uh, here you find uh, some of them, Carola Schoenlip, who is a professor in Cambridge, uh, Paula Castro and David Villasiz, uh, who are PhD students of mine, and Luca Calatroni and Tuomo Balconen, who worked also in some joint papers on this, uh, on this topic. So um, the outline of the talk is the following one. You can see that, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, I will start uh, by presenting the, the bi-level learning framework for inverse problems in a general manner. Uh, and explain uh, some of the features that uh, that may have, uh, especially for, for linear inverse problems. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about the inverse problems that arise in image processing, mainly in denoising and what the difficulties uh, are given there. Um, then I explained uh, the bi-level learning framework uh, with variational data simulation problems and finally some conclusions uh, in general about the work. So I'll start in a very general sense uh, with an inverse problem that uh, you all are familiar with. Uh, this is just uh, giving some corrupted data. Uh, you may want to find a solution uh, of this equation, this frequentist uh, approach in this context uh, where the solution is affected by a forward operator that uh, typically models the relation between uh, the solution and the noise. And a part of that, you have the noise component uh, in this part. And uh, usually, the difficulties in, in inverse problems have to do with the fact that the, this, in general, an unbounded uh, operator has an unbounded inverse, and that uh, may cause several difficulties, like instabilities, lack of uniqueness, uh, and so on. And uh, typically, what you do in inverse problems, uh, you are all familiar with that, is you use some sort of regularization uh, using information that you have beforehand about the solution and the solution properties, mainly the regularity properties of the, of the solution. In the specific case of the variational approach that we are considering, uh, you have uh, or you combine these uh, two features uh, concerning the, the data fidelity and the regularization in one joint functional that you want to, to minimize. And in this functional, what you have is in this part, the regularizing term, which is the prior knowledge that you have from the, from the image. And uh, that regularization terms usually includes the, the regularity of the solution, being that an image or an inverse problem solution in general. And a part of that uh, on the right hand side, uh, you usually have the data model, which uh, prescribes in some way uh, what uh, the forward model uh, has to be followed by the solution of the of the problem and in between in this uh, in the context of this talk in the data fidelity model you usually have a lot of parameters one several parameters that are important to tune uh, to get better reconstruction results uh, it may be a weight in front of this uh, data fidelity term or even something much more complex uh, to deal with. And as you can imagine, the result depends on the prior that you choose for the, for the inverse problems at hand. Uh, 
that uh, it, that may include the regularity of the image or the solution, the basis representations on sparsity, and also the data model that you consider. But another important ingredient, and that's the ingredient that you that we are going to focus on this talk, is uh, the choice of the parameters that weigh the ones against the other. So this is a, a small example of image denoising uh, where we used uh, some, some cards uh, which are typically very appropriate for reconstructing with total variation. And here you can see what happens if you, if you consider a denoising uh, or, a, or a variational denoising problem, but uh, you don't use that much regularization there. So you still have a lot of noise in the, in the image but if you consider, on the other hand, a lot of regularization, then you may end up with this over-regularized image on the right-hand side, where you, a part of getting rid of the noise, you get rid of the whole details of the image. And something in between is, uh, is the way to go, and it's the optimal choice that you may, uh, may done for the, for the regularization parameter of. Now, um, the bi-level learning approach actually um, focus on the choice of these uh, parameters in an optimal way. And it presupposes the existence of a training set uh, where there are many noisy measurements in principle, and you also have the ground truth data uh, that you can learn from. So this training set can be one single pair, or it can be many uh, if, you are, if you have that information at hand. But you use that actively in the formulation of the bi-level problem. And the bi-level problem consists in minimizing some loss, loss function that compares the ground truth uh, solution to the solution that you uh, become from the, that you get from the constraint, uh, from the variational problem that you have as a constraint. And this variational problem is the minimization of the energy that we saw before. Uh, and you have, in principle, one optimization problem on top and one optimization problem in the lower level. So it's one as a constraint and one in the upper level. And uh, typically, in, in this general fashion, we consider a function space or a finite dimensional space B where the solution has to lie. And the operator T that is involved in the, in the data fidelity may be linear, non-linear, non-local, a PDE solution operator, etc. you name it. So you can deal with different type of, uh, of operators there. And of course, there are many difficulties that arise when you choose one or the other. And typically the regularization term in this part uh, is assumed to be strongly convex uh, to get the solution, to get uh, some, some properties uh, there, but it may still be non-smooth. And a part of that, uh, the parameters may be a scalar, may be a vector, may be a function. Uh, there is also plenty of possibilities there uh, to deal or to tune that, that, uh, those parameters. So typically what you do in the first idea on this, in this context of, of this bi-level optimization problem is uh, you are tempted to replace this optimization problem by the first order necessary optimality condition. And this is, as we will see in the next slide, uh, this is a way to go if you have a, a linear problem. But if T is not linear or R is not differentiable, then you cannot do that that easily and then the whole difficulties arise. So uh, let me comment on some references. The first work uh, we are aware of uh, in, this, uh, in this context is the work by Leo Horish and co-workers from 2003, where they deal with the, this bi-level learning with, with linear inverse problems. Afterwards, uh, uh, by the work by Tappen and co-workers, uh, they deal with uh, some Markov random field image processing task and use also a bi-level optimization approach. And afterwards, uh, we started to work in this field with uh, mainly variational problems in image processing. And uh, thereafter, many, many works uh, came to with, the, with different kind of inverse problems and, and settings uh, appear. So in the case of a linear inverse problems, and now I'm using a single training pair for, for simplicity. So you have just one true 
solution and some noisy solution or some noisy measurement and you want to learn from this uh, true solution. So uh, the aim here is to minimize this loss function subject to this uh, variational minimization problem. And in this setting, uh, we assume that R is strongly convex, but a part of that is continuously differentiable. And T is a linear operator. Once you have this uh, linear operator and the convexity, then you may replace the bi-level problem as a single level optimization problem where you just have the optimality condition of this one as a constraint of this optimization problem. This is the ideal scenario because in that case you just have a single level formulation problem but a part of that you can prove things concerning the solution on, of each of them. So in principle you may have the, the optimal solution from this bi-level problem and in general, it may not coincide with the solution of this single level optimization problem. And that's something that uh, doesn't happen in the linear case. In the linear case, you have the best scenario. So uh, thanks to this convexity, uh, and you also do not have mixed constraints of the different variables, then the solution of this one is the solution of the other. And there's a, there's a complete coherence between both of them. Now, um, what happens if the operator is not linear or if the regularizer is non-smooth, then uh, different things uh, occur. So in the context of imaging inverse problems, for instance, um, in this case, using a total variation Gaussian denoising, the bi-level learning framework uh, consists in minimizing uh, the same loss function. So you compare the true image with the, with the image that you get from this variational denoising problem. And in this denoising problem, you have uh, some square fit in here, which is the Gaussian uh, model of the, of the noise. And the parameters that we want to optimize are the parameters in front of this fidelity, which are as many as the pixels of the image in this, in this context. And a part of that, and that's the main difficulty in this part, you have this uh, convex but non-smooth total variation term. This K operator is uh, responsible, is, consists of the discrete gradient operator and is responsible for the sparse reconstruction of the gradient of the image. So it enforces uh, some piecewise constant reconstruction of a given image. And for instance, in the case of the cards that I showed before, this is a, an, ideal, an ideal regularizer because the, the a priori knowledge that we have from the cards is the cards are just black and white. Uh, images. And thanks to the convexity, so in this case we cannot take just the derivative of the regularizer, but uh, we can use some primal dual uh, reformulation. So there is convexity, there's duality, and we may want to reformulate the constraint, this bi-level or this lower level problem, and replace with the primal dual optimality conditions. So in, this, uh, in these equations you can observe that the first one is an easy one, but in the second and third equations, you just, you have again, the Euclidean norm uh, in the constraints and the Euclidean norm is responsible for the non-smoothness. So you may want maybe to, to square those terms and consider uh, some sort of regularization in the sense of squaring everything. But in that case, uh, the single level optimal optimization problem doesn't fulfill standard constraint qualification conditions. So the main difficulty in this case, where, when the regularizer is not smooth, comes from the fact that the optimization problem is quite, quite difficult to handle. So in this case, different tools are required. Uh, one of them that I will explain briefly is uh, the so-called variation analysis. So typically what you have in optimization is you get uh, the tangent cone and uh, you also define the Frechet normal cone. And typically what you have to verify in a constraint qualification is that this uh, Frechet normal cone can be represented through the gradients of the constraints. So there's a, some sort of linearization or representation uh, of this uh, Frechet normal cone. But in our case, for instance, these constraint qualification conditions are not fulfilled. So instead of that, uh, what we use in this variational analysis framework is something more general, which is called the Mordukovich normal cone. And the Mordukovich normal cone doesn't only take 
into account uh, normals to the tangent cone, but also approximations of uh, the normal direction at the end through directions which are belonging to the Frechet normal cone. So let me explain briefly in this, uh, in this plot here. Uh, we consider this point in this corner and we have this set which is consisting of these three lines. And if we approximate this point through these lines in a tangent way, then we end up with something which is like this as a tangent cone. And of course, the Frechet normal cone is just the zone which is uh, orange on the picture and is uh, very restrictive. Well, if you approximate through normal directions as well, then you consider the approximations in these points, like the, these blue lines, and you end up at the end, not only with the Frechet normal cone, but also with these lines which are extended in this part. So the Nord Mordukovich normal cone is larger than the Frechet normal cone, and that allows, to, that allows a little bit of flexibility concerning the constraint qualification conditions. And that's uh, something that we may verify in the context of the image processing problem. So uh, at the end, uh, after some computations, uh, which are quite involved concerning the, the Mordukovich normal cone, you end up with an optimality system, which is similar or very related to a standard KKT system. But the problem is that you have something which is not as sharp as that case. Here you can observe this is a so-called biactive set of the, of the problem. And this biactive set is responsible for the non-smoothness, for the heavy non-smoothness. And you have three possibilities on this biactive set. It's something similar as the plot before. So you have the Frechet normal cone on one hand, but you have also many possibilities of these lines that were shown in the plot before. Nevertheless, you can uh, characterize the solutions through this so-called M stationary point, and you can compute some solutions of the bi-level problem in imaging. Here, is a, here are some experimental results where we use patches functions, uh, where we optimize the weight of each of these, these patches in the, in the images. And this is already on a validation set. And you obtain, of course, for each of these uh, sizes of patches, we obtain the optimal solutions and the reconstructions that, uh, that are given there. Now, in this case, we found out that the best uh, possibility is to use uh, eight times eight uh, patches of the image, and then we obtain a better reconstruction for the validation set. So it's not over regularized in that sense, and uh, it has many good generalization properties. Let me go now to the variational data simulation problem, which is a much more complicated uh, setting. Uh, typically, variational data simulation is used in, in weather forecasting. And in variational data simulation, what you do is uh, you put as constrained the dynamical system that you want to, to consider, and you want to estimate the initial condition of the problem. And for the initial condition, you use in this some sort of Bayesian approach. Uh, you use the observations, some observation operator. You use some background uh, initial condition that you may have in advance, let's say the, the forecast in the whole, in the whole globe. And a part of that, typically, what you have to consider are these uh, two matrices, which are the error and background covariance matrices, which are the important thing to, to take into account in variational data simulation. But in this setting, this four-dimensional or 4D bar um, allows you to incorporate the whole dynamic of the problem in, as a specific constraint. You may linearize that, but in principle, you may consider a nonlinear problem. And uh, that's a good thing to consider in that setting. And of course, uh, the reconstruction strongly depends on the observations. And in principle, um, you have a number of observations that you can assimilate in this, in this setting. So uh, we are currently in charge of the weather forecasting in, here in Ecuador. And, and at some point where we were doing, when we were doing the, the first forecasts, we could assimilate eight, uh, eight sources of, the, of data, which were the airports in the country, with, which is not really a lot. And you can see here the distribution of the observation stations around the, the Earth. And you can observe that in Africa or many parts of South America, we are very undersampled concerning the observations. So the question at that point, 
we were sure that many observations were required, but the question at that point was where should we locate those observation stations? That's, that's the main, because every observation station that you locate costs a lot of money, there's not plenty of money, so you have to choose the best possible locations for that. And so uh, what we did is actually we uh, included, this is just a semi-linear toy example that we use. Uh, so the constraint, of course, is not the dynamical system of the atmosphere, it's just a, a semi-linear PDE. But uh, we consider the four-dimensional problem in this, in this context. Uh, the matrices are the identity matrices to, to, for simplicity. And we consider different type of weights that we have to choose. This W is a, a vector of zero and ones in principle, and they are one if you locate a, a station at a specific a, a place. And a part of that, there are some weights, a sigma, which are related to when you should measure, at which time point you should measure. So this term, this quadratic, this simple quadratic term is affected by these two integer vectors, zero, one vectors. And a part of that, to get well posedness of the equation, mainly to get continuity of the state variable, we have to add some additional regularization term, which is related to the H1 norm in this context. Of course, this regularization parameter can be as small as you want, but it has to be there to get the regularity. And the solution operator is clearly a nonlinear operator. It maps a u to y through the solution of the semi-linear equation, and there is the non-linearity. So things get, in this, at this point, with this problem, very complicated. Um, here is the optimality system for the 4D bar. You have the state equation. You have an adjoint that you have to consider as a very weak, in a very weak form. You have only a very weak solution because due to the pointwise measurements that you have in the cost function, you just have regular boreal measures in the, in the adjoint equation. And that's a source of many complications uh, concerning regularity. And a part of that, uh, the gradient equation, which is provided in this part, is also a PDE, is a stationary one in this case. But uh, these whole equations con uh, constitute the optimality system of the 4D bar problem. Now, these are necessary, but not sufficient optimality conditions due to the nonlinearity that we have in the solution operator. So in principle, what we solve or want to solve is this complicated bi-level problem where we have some loss functions that compare ground truth solutions, states in principle, ground truth initial conditions, but a part of that, we have the weights which are in zero one, are just zero one elements. And uh, we add some costs uh, to, uh, to these terms just to penalize uh, the location of each one of them. And the problem of course is, uh, or the lower level is of course the 4D bar problem. And this, this is the source of the, of the many difficulties there. So uh, what we do is actually, uh, as I mentioned, we consider some penalty cost, uh, the training set, some loss functions which may be different from for each one of them. And the aim is to learn exactly what the vectors uh, or where, when the vectors become one or zero in this setting to, to be able to, to detect where to place the station. So um, in this uh, setting, since we are not integer optimization people, uh, what we do is actually we relax the integer constraints and we consider just uh, the parameters in C between zero and one. But uh, to enforce the sparsity and to get actually the solution that we want, we penalize with some, uh, with some weights beta uh, in a sparse way. I mean, we can get rid of the absolute value in here because we have positivity, but still we, we are enforcing sparsity for those terms. And we constrained the, this bi-level problem uh, to the optimality system of the, four, of the 4D bar, but since we are dealing with a nonlinear operator, this optimality system has not a unique solution. So uh, you cannot do what, what we did in the linear inverse problems, which, which was uh, quite uh, easy, but we have to deal with multiple solutions of the lower level constraints. So uh, what we did in this, uh, in this context was to consider uh, 
an adapted penalty approach uh, which, which fixes a, a solution beforehand and then it constructs or it, you can prove the existence of multipliers around that solution. And uh, we obtain uh, the characterization through this optimality system. This is the adjoint uh, problem, which is quite complicated already. Uh, we have a gradient system uh, which relates uh, these integrals of the, of the solutions with some multipliers which are in complementarity with the weights. And uh, the good thing is uh, with this optimality system, we could solve something and obtain a solution. This is just a toy example I will, I will show you. So in this experiment, the placement is allowed in any grid point and the observations are taken in every time step as well. And uh, the idea in these uh, numerical experiments is to test how the weights change uh, the structure of the solution. So in principle, what we obtain is uh, this solution if the weights are small, but then if you increase the weights, then you are getting the sparsity that you want at the end. And you can get further and further to get less and less uh, places where you have to locate observation stations. So let me come to the, to the conclusions. Um, first of all, for variational inverse problems, which are the ones that we are considering, uh, the optimal combinations of parameters, parameter functions, data models, and so on, uh, may be chosen with a bi-level learning approach. In the case of linear inverse problems, this is a very, very nice tool because then you have a necessary and sufficient optimality condition and you can replace the bi-level with a single level. For imaging inverse problems, the, the task is a little bit more difficult because you need different uh, tools like variational analysis and non-smooth analysis to get some sort of stationarity systems. And of course, the the most difficult is related to the nonlinearity in the in the constraints, mainly the four-dimensional variational simulation problems, where that causes many troubles uh, for obtaining some some results. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. I have a question. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I go? Um, when you were talking about the patches, can you explain a little bit more how you use them? I didn't understand that part. Yes, um, maybe I should share again. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. So in this part, what I consider here in, in the problem setting actually was uh, every pixel has a parameter, right? So this is exactly the last case. This is the spatially dependent. So we have as many degrees of freedom as pixels of the image. So you choose for each pixel the optimal, let's say. But in these other um, problems in between, what we did is uh, we split the image in, for instance, in this part, in these patches, and we optimize the weight in each of the, these patches. So these patches uh, encompass very, a lot of pixels and you have the same scalar for all of them. So it's less degrees of freedom, and if you have less degrees of freedom, of course, the, the extreme case is just using a one scalar, and, and that, then, you, then you can optimize that, that one. But uh, we found out that the patches, this, this number of patches is very good in this context of these phases uh, to get a, a good solution. Because the, otherwise, the point is, if you, for instance, consider this especially dependent, and you have some training set, then you find the best especially dependent function for that training set, but then you apply to a validation set and it's not worth anymore. That's the main, the main issue. Thank you. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, me. Okay, um, okay, so thank you for a very nice talk. Um, uh, my question is more technical. So in, in terms of, um, let's say, training data, so how much training data do you need um, for, for, for this case? And uh, is it computationally very expensive, like the method, or is it, um, is it like fine to, to, to run it? How, how long does it take and so on? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's uh, we didn't we didn't have an uh, we don't have an estimate of the number, so it's like typically you have an estimate. So we tested uh, we tested with 
up to 20 pairs. Uh, we didn't go further, so uh, that depends on the application you have at hand. Uh, it is costly, yes, it is costly. The advantage is that uh, the lower level problems you can parallelize, that's a good thing. So each one of them, you can, you can shift to a different processor and then you get a solution of that one and then you incorporate, incorporate that solution. But this is still very costly, yes. So uh, it doesn't take that long, but uh, depending on the, on the resolution that you have, for instance, in the imaging cases, it may take from 10 seconds to one afternoon. So you have different sorts of, of possibilities there, but it is costly, of course. Yeah, I see. But thank you. But when you, for example, when you do for uh, the the sparsity, uh, let's say, so how many parameters do you have to learn over over there? Like when when you are interested in a, in a sparse solution. In which one you mean? In the four dimensional, or in the imaging? In in imaging. So, for instance, this one, this one that I I'm pointing right now is, is the most costly one because you have uh, for, each, uh, for each pixel one value, right? So you may end up with, uh, with a lot of optimization variables in the, low, in the upper level problem. But of course, if you have these patches eight times eight, then of course the number of variables, explicit variables in the upper level uh, becomes much smaller. And then the whole difficulty is, is concerned with the solution of the, of the variational problems in between. So this is, uh, this is the, main, main, the main issue, but still, I mean, this is quite a number of, uh, of points and you can solve that. Uh, I mean, it costs, but it costs less than training a neural network, for instance, which is uh, something good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Juan Carlos. I think we can continue and then if there is another question or comment, we can use like a break and we can talk a little bit more. Okay, so thank you very much. And now, Julieta, um, I don't know if you want to try if you can share the screen and then I can present you. Sure, give me one second to do full screen, please. Great. Yes, we can see it. So our next speaker is Mirieta Pasha from the University of State, uh, I'm sorry, from Arizona State University from the United States. She's going to present the work titled Efficient Edge Preserving Methods for Large Scale Dynamics Inverse Problems. This is a short work together with Madena Espanol from the Arizona State University from the United States. Celia Garzola from the University of Bath in the UK. Arvin Saibaba from North Carolina State University. And Eric De Studer from Virginia Tech. So if you're ready, we can ah, sorry, a question. Are you okay if we, um, if we record the, the talk? Yes, um, yeah, it is fine. Thank you. Okay. So, Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Mariela, for, for the presentation. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizers of the conference as well as the organizers of this session uh, uh, that gave me the opportunity to give this talk today. Um, today I'm gonna talk about some um, joint work with, uh, that has uh, in, in, uh, in the center um, dynamic, large scale dy dynamic inverse problems. Uh, and uh, this is joint work with uh, Arvind Saibaba at North Carolina State University, Silvia Gazola at University of Bath in United Kingdom, um, Malena Spanov, that is also my, uh, my postdoc mentor here at Arizona State University, um, and Eric Besserler uh, at Virginia Tech. So um, to start with uh, setting up some notation, I will just start with uh, the mathematical problem set up that we are interested in, um, in considering in this case. So um, let's say we only have in, um, in this specific case that I'm starting with, we only have one image that we're interested in, uh, and we want to solve this um, minimization problem over here, uh, which is basically uh, minimize this, uh, this problem where we have AU um, equal to B. Uh, now, in, in the, uh, 
uh, in this framework, we have uh, a what we ideally would want is uh, a u true and equal to b true. But unfortunately, we don't have that b true because uh, from different uh, sources, let's say from um, in different measurements and so on, we get some errors uh, that may stem from different so uh, sources. So uh, what we have available is actually um, some some noisy measurements. That is this uh, vector over here or or matrix, if you wish, uh, which is the b. Uh, you true are the desired uh, the solution, or maybe uh, we can call them the unknown quantity of interest in general. And A, uh, what is A here is the parameter to observable map. Um, this is uh, in the cases that I'm considering today uh, here, uh, we consider a uh, linear map, but uh, you can also consider uh, nonlinear as well. Um, B true are the, no the data without noise, but th th they are not available uh, and uh, E is the, the noise. So here um, in this talk today, I'm going to use only uh, Gaussian noise, and which is a white Gaussian noise, but um, the framework uh, that I'm going to uh, talk today actually can uh, especially the solution method can handle also other type of noises. Um, this type of mathematical uh, problem setup actually has a lot of uh, applications. We will be focused, focused today in mostly in imaging uh, and computer, uh, let's say image blurring and computerized tomography, uh, but there are many other applications when, when one can apply those techniques. So uh, to start with an example, uh, let's say we have an image here and this is basically a simulation. Uh, we would say, so suppose that we know the true uh, solution, uh, suppose that we also have information about the, the blurring operator, uh, the point spread function that will uh, give us the, the forward operator. We have the knowledge for the noise and then we get this um, uh, measure data. Now, uh, if we want to solve this, uh, let's say, this squares problem over here, uh, we could try with the naive solution. So basically, we, uh, if we have, we can compute the, the inverse um, of this operator over here, we have a, if we have a square matrix, or otherwise we can compute the pseudo inverse of it uh, and try to, to find the solution that we call it here, uh, naive solution. Well, we have two parts here. Uh, since this B is uh, B true plus some errors, then uh, we have the first part um, that is A dega B true, and then the second part, which is A dega. Uh, so the first part actually is bounded um, since B true is in the range of A and so on, but then uh, the noise is not in the range of A, um, so it can be arbitrarily large and it can uh, uh, corrupt our solution. So basically this is what is going to happen. Uh, we all know what happens, so if we, if we get this, um, this uh, solution over here. So just really quickly I'll go over this. Um, so what we are interested in is uh, we are interested in regularization methods to, to solve this type of problems. Um, and uh, the general framework that I'm going to talk about today is uh, this here. So we want to minimize this, um, this functional over here where um, that has two main parts. The first part is called the data fidelity term and the second part is called the regularization term. Um, so when we solve this type of problems, actually, there are many errors that uh, come into, um, into the area. So basically, we have uh, algorithm errors, we have model errors, we have data errors, we have regularization error, and so on. Um, so to notice over here is um, that so I am using here in like a general case where I have a P norm for the data fidelity term and the Q norm for the um, for the regularization term. So now the the whole idea here is that why do we need this P norm in the data fidelity term and why do we need the Q norm in the uh, the Q norm in the in the regularization term? And um, the the idea is that we use different values of P here. So for example, if we have Gaussian noise, then uh, using P equal to two um, will be fine, uh, just like in, in the in the standard. Tikhonov, but if you have other type of noise or if you have errors in your uh, in your uh, model, let's say here, you, if you don't know exactly what is that operator, then you may, may need um, other type of um, other type of values of, of p over here. So basically, the whole idea is that by using this um, this type of schema, you get a regularized uh, problem that looks uh, like this. Now uh, there are other there are other applications, and one of them is in computerized tomography, uh, especially in the limited angles. Uh, and uh, today I will, I will talk more about this because we are interested in this type of applications where we have, uh, let's say, li limited measurements uh, uh, that are um, obtained by limited angles and so on. So what is a computerized tomography? So if we have an object of interest, so this nice smiley face over here, we 
different angles uh, that we can, uh, let's say we can, we can shine some um, X-rays and uh, to get with, with some detector, then we can collect some data. Now, uh, suppose that uh, those, uh, this smiley face over here in real applications are uh, human cells, let's say, or um, biological cells. So we are, um, we, we would like to, to reduce this number of X-rays that go through the body. Uh, but in, in mathematically, this means that we are missing part of information. And uh, if we miss part of information, then the reversion process is going to be even more difficult. Uh, so what we'd like to do, we would like to obtain a reconstruction that uh, gives a very nice, um, uh, gives a very nice or features all the, uh, gives all the features that we have in, in this object of interest um, that is not non-transparent for us. So uh, what, what we do here is that, uh, so basically these are, the, this is, these are uh, some of the applications that we are interested in. Uh, now suppose that uh, we don't have only one image um, uh, but we have a bunch of images and uh, let's say we have this data set over here as we see sorry as we see we start with uh, we start with an image here that uh, doesn't have expressions and then in, in the face and then we start we end up with, uh, with a smiley face so suppose that we have this type of data but um, the data at each at each step over here is very limited. Let's say we don't have too much information for each one of those uh, of those steps here, but overall uh, we have plenty of data. And uh, as you see, this is a dynamic, uh, let's say, um, inverse uh, inverse problem because uh, the the object of inter of interest over here changes um, in time, but also the the operator uh, changes in time. And I'll I'll talk a little bit more about this. So the goal um, for us here is. To develop some methods that can um, can reconstruct the images that we're interested in, and uh, and also discover the dynamics on on those images, uh, very good. Uh, and another thing is that we would like to preserve it edges. So as you see here, there are, um, there are some edges that uh, we would like to preserve. Now, if you choose your favorite method, and let's say. Um, uh, choose those small sinograms, which are the data that we um, that we have here, and just try to reconstruct those uh, those images individually. Then you are going to get some reconstruction that looks like this, that actually doesn't give you any insight what the image is. Um, but what we do by by using those methods and by uh, using the dynamics of those images at different at different time instances, we are able to reconstruct uh, th those images. Um, pretty good as you as you can see here which is a very nice uh, reconstruction so this is basically what i will be talking um, uh, today and i will uh, try to explain uh, what kind of methods we have we propose in this work and so on so um to get started um with the dynamic inverse problem um so here we don't only have, uh, let's say, one linear system to solve, like AX equal to B or AU equal to, to, to D, uh, but we, we have a lot of them. So basically, we have, um, we have a large system. And uh, if we solve the stat static inverse problem, it means that for each of those uh, linear systems, then we would, we would solve the minimization problem individually. While for the dynamic inverse problem, what we want to do, we want to solve this large system with some regularization term over here in general. And in that regularization term, we would like to impose different constraints um, that uh, in this case, we are interested in preserving edges. And uh, we, I will go through uh, different techniques that we, we aim to or, or we develop to, to preserve those edges. Now, uh, to stop a little bit here in the dynamic numbers problems and to see the, the difference between them. So, um we consider the case for dynamic inverse problems. Uh, we consider two cases when the measurement operator is time independent. Uh, then, for that case, the large um, the large forward operator over here can it's uh, it's actually um, can be formed in this way, uh, and only uh, the image will change in time. While uh, the other case is if you have the measurement operator is to be time dependent. For example, um, if you if you uh, if you uh, consider that uh, computerized tomography example, then uh, you say that the, you, you make those measurements at different types of angles and so on. So it, the, the measurement operator changes in time um, also. So in that case, you are going to have this uh, uh, very large matrix over here uh, that models the forward problem. Now, when you solve this type of problems, uh, even when we solve one linear system over here, um, it has a lot of issues, I would say. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. Um, there are large, uh, if your image, for example, if you have large images, then your operator is going to be very large. Uh, and there are issues uh, like computational issues. Um, there are maybe memory problems um, and also like the, the closeness of, of this type of uh, problems that we are dealing with. Now, 
On top of that, when you consider dynamic inverse problems and you want to discover the dynamics, uh, then um, the challenges are, are added on top of that, more cha challenges, I would say. So uh, in this case, uh, you will have, again, uh, more large-scale problems to solve. Uh, you will have millions of parameters um, to reconstruct. Um, we, we add on top of that, so we want solutions with edges that makes our uh, minimization problem even more difficult. And we also want to discover those dynamics in the data. So what we do actually, so just to give um, uh, an overview of, of what we are doing here, is that suppose that we have all those images. So suppose that these are the images that we are interested in. Uh, then we, what we do, we vectorize all those images. Um, was the first attempt that basically we did here. Like um, we vectorize all those images and then by vectorizing those images um, and then we get this uh, very large system that we are interested in solving. Um, I would like to stop a little bit in the uh, in another uh, important part over here, which is basically the sparse reconstruction. Um, and I'll try to, to illustrate this a little bit. So I, I mentioned that we are interested in uh, uh, developing methods that will preserve the edges for us. So um, in principle, what we are interested in, for example, if we want to preserve edges or if we want sparse solutions, that we want um, to, to reconstruct some solutions and uh, maybe minimize the, the L0 norm. So if you, if you choose with Q equal to zero, but that is an empty hard problem. And what we want to do, we want to approximate it with the best um, approximation. I'm not saying the convex approximation here. If we choose that Q to be one, then you have the convex approximation over here. But there are results showing that choosing that Q smaller than one gives you even better, uh, better uh, results. And I'm, I'm illustrating this um, over here. So um, together, not only with changing this Q, but also changing this, uh, this operator here to be, for example, uh, a total variation operator. So um, with this in mind, uh, and we, what else we do here is that we develop methods that are based on curl of subspace methods. So I mentioned um, a little bit earlier where uh, we have, uh, let's say, challenges. And one of the challenges is the, the dimension of the problem. So we want to do some dimension reduction. And what we use over here is we use Krell of subspace type methods. So just to give a, a brief um, introduction to them, what, what it means is that if you are solving this uh, minimization problem over here, and this A over here is very large, for example, millions by millions, then you can use the, you can build those different decompositions, let's say by Golukahan or Arnoldi, depending on what you're trying to solve. Uh, and if if you have that decomposition, then you can project your problem to, uh, to a smaller problem and solve the smaller problem instead of the large problem. Um, so, th so this is the, the whole idea what we're trying here to do with the curl of subspace methods. And I'll, I'll show a little bit more about this uh, in, the, in the coming slides. So uh, let's propose, um, uh, as an overview, what we do in this work, we propose six different methods actually, um, and they have uh, different flavors uh, depending on what we're trying to reconstruct, uh, and they can be applied in different applications. Uh, but the, the center or, or the, the goal over here is to, to preserve the edges. And one of the methods that we are proposing here is anisotropic space time total variation. So what we do here is that um, uh, let me show you the, uh, the the regularization. So basically, the regularization term is going to turn out to be uh, in, or, or uh, formed from two parts. So the first part, uh, what we are um, aiming over here is that in space. So let's say for each image, uh, we want. Uh, sparse reconstruction, or let's say we want to preserve the edges in space, uh, but also in time. So we, 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 we say, okay, we want also sparse changes in time, so at different time steps, uh, let's say uh, from time uh, t plus one to, uh, from time t to, to time t plus one. Uh, by, very, by some very simple uh, manipulations over here, we can write this regularization term in this part where we have basically a sum of two uh, one norms here in the regularization term. And um, all that we have here, you see we have different operators. Uh, we have different operator, operators for each case. And all what this is doing is just imposing um, different constraints, let's say total variation and, and so on for, uh, for the spatial and also the, the temporal, temporal uh, directions. So and now, but what is the idea? So what do we do um, after this? Uh, another one thing to notice here is that the framework that we have, sorry, the framework that we have, even though um, I will explain uh, throughout this work that we use um, one norms over here, it can be generalized at, at uh, general uh, cues, but for 
uh, for convergence issues and so on, we, we stick to Q equal to one. Um, what is the technique that we use? Uh, we use a majorization minimization, and this is the nice thing because one can write many, uh, let's say many manuscripts and, and write or propose different methods. But the nice thing why we were able to, pr to propose so many methods in this uh, manuscript is because they, uh, they can all fall um, or they can uh, all fit in the framework of uh, majorization minimization. So basically, we have some type of regularization term over here. And what we do, we uh, measureize and then minimize the functional uh, that we're interested in. Um, so basically, the, the idea is pretty simple. So we, what we do is that instead of solving for, for that regularization term, then we, we build some weights for the regularization term. And then once we have the weights, then we build a quadratic tangent measurement um, to measurize the functional that we are interested in. Uh, and then once we have that uh, quadratic tangent measurement, then we can uh, we can continue the normal um, the normal process of, um, of solving it. So as we see here, um, from an L1 problem, minimization problem that may, that is um, might be difficult to solve, or in general, if you have an LQ, it will be even more difficult. Then now, what we do here, we uh, we transform it to a to a, to a Tikhonov form here by by having those weights uh, weighting matrices over here at each iteration. Um, and this is the beauty of it, but still we haven't uh, solved the issue of having very large scale problems. I mean, this is a Tikhonov problem, of course, but it, it may be uh, difficult to solve. So what we are using here is, um, uh, it's called an MMGKS method. Um, there are some contributions on, on this type of methods uh, that I've listed over here, and there are many other uh, references as well. But the whole idea is that if you have a functional of this type to minimize, um, then what you want to do, uh, you want to build the quadratic tangent measurement, and then once you have that quadratic tangent measurement, then you can project that problem in a smaller subspace and um, do this iteratively until, until you converge. So the whole idea is like this. So let's say this is the um, function that you want to minimize at each point. What you do, you build those quadratic tangent measurements, uh, and you make sure that uh, at each step you're going to have uh, a minimizer, unique minimizer and then you continue in this way until the minimizer uh, minimum is reached. Um, so basically, this is the technique that we use to give a little bit more details on it. So we, uh, we smooth the functional that we are considering by, by very, uh, very traditional uh, smoothing technique, I would say. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we consider the smooth functional um, we build that quadratic tangent measurement, and then we compute the grad gradient um, with respect to x, and then um, the minimizer of this quadratic tangent measurement actually will be given by this, and then we continue in this way. Now, to talk a little bit about the Krilov subspace method is that what we do, uh, we first generate a starting subspace, let's say by running the Goldkahan um, algorithm, and then once we have that starting subspace, then we can start solving those small problems and then project back and continue in this, uh, in this way. Uh, a very nice thing here is that we know how important the regularization parameter is in, uh, when we solve, for example, imaging problems. Uh, and that would cause uh, actually a lot, of, uh, a lot of trouble if it's not defined well, but also it will cause uh, numerical issues and also computational issues um, if, if, you, if you're solving large scale problems. The beautiful thing about this method that we are using here is that at each step, we are able to solve this uh, projected problem over here, which is small. And um, with that projected problem, we can actually, in that projected problem, we can actually uh, define the regularization parameter as well at each iteration uh, with a very uh, low computational cost. So, the whole idea is that we start with a small subspace, uh, we, we solve, we find a, an approximate solution, uh, and then we continue computer residual and then enlarge the solution subspace and so on until we're happy with, uh, with the solution that we, uh, approximate solution that we get. So basically, this helps us uh, to solve those very large scale problems in a computational reason, reasonable time um, and to avoid having also memory issues. Now, another model that we propose, which is very similar to the first one, is um, we consider the regularization term over here to be an L1 in space, but to be an L2 in, in time. Um, and actually here, uh, with a very uh, small change in, in defining those weights, 
um, the first part is going to be the same. While if you see here, the second part does not need any uh, majorization at all because basically it's an L2. So we just uh, put the identity over there and then we obtain the, um, the quadratic tangent measurement and then we continue in this way. I'll just quickly go um, over those other methods that we propose. Um, another method is called anisotropic space-time total variation. Um, so what we do over here is uh, we consider let's say we consider the tensor, uh, we, we define our data as a tensor, let's say, uh, and we do the, let's say, multiplication with those operators, um, derivative operators, basically in time and space in each direction, uh, and we define a regularization term that is based on, 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 uh, on those um, that is based on those uh, on those terms. We define the weights, and then as well, um, we define the quadratic tangent measure. And then once we have the quadratic tangent measure, and then everything falls in uh, very easily. Another method is uh, the three, 3D space-time isotropic total variation. So um, the isotropic total variation uh, is a little bit. Um, I'd say another variation of, of the methods that we are using here is just the uh, the definition, different definitions basically of the of the total variation. Um, and um, again, in the same idea, we define the weights um, and then we define the quadratic tangent measure and, uh, and we continue in this way. The other method is um, the isotropic in space but anisotropic in, uh, in time total variation. Um, so basically, in the first term, again, uh, we use the isotropic in space, but anisotropic in, um, in time. And uh, again, we, we explain over here how we define those weights and so on. Um, another another method that I'm excited about is actually uh, uh, directional or group sparsity. It has many applications other than imaging. Um, but uh, over here, we, we propose only one, one method that is based on the directional group sparsity, uh, but based on different applications, one can um, adjust those weights and, and define many other um, methods that are based on the, on the, on the group sparsity, basically. Um, and the whole idea here is to, to define different groups uh, that are very clear. So, for example, we may have data uh, that are that are clearly grouped into different, uh, let's say, into, into different groups. So we, we would like to, to take advantage of those characteristics that we have in our data. Uh, so as a summary of all the methods, basically, um, these are the, the type of methods that we propose over here, um, and we put together the regularization terms that we have. Uh, in consideration of time, I, I would like to jump directly to the numerical examples. So we consider different type of applications for these techniques, actually. The first one is space-time image deblurring. So let's say you have different images, and if we see here carefully, we, they change a little bit in time. So here we have the presence of some um, some details, uh, while in the others we don't. Um, here we have uh, used, let's say, uh, motion uh, PSF uh, to, to blur this image and 1% Gaussian, and then we use the, the techniques and we see very nice reconstruction um, overall. Sorry, this is not a typical example where you, where you don't have a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of data or limited uh, data, but what we use this is because we have all the, the we have all the information that we need, basically. We have the true solution and so on, so we can compare uh, those methods. Um, we can compare those methods, basically, uh, which one of, that, of them does better than the other. Um, and I would say that um, the good thing about uh, our, our methods is that uh, we cannot say which one of them is better than the other because the, we, we tested in different applications and one performed better than the other, um, depending on those applications. Another application is the dynamic photoacoustic tomography, which is actually a very uh, interesting technique, which is non-invasive, non-ionizing imaging modality. Uh, and you can formulate the problem in the same way um, as we did from, from, from the previous one. Uh, and the, the idea is that if you have those spherical projections over here, then you, have to, you, you need to find the initial pressure. And this is, again, very computationally expensive. Uh, one example of it will be here. So here we have a sample of two images. Here we have a sample of three true sinograms um, of sinograms. And here is the full uh, sinogram for the dynamic inverse problem. So we tested basically the methods uh, for different types of uh, for, for different type of those data uh, and um, we, we ended up saying that solving the dynamic problem really helps and, and uh, discovers the dynamic in, in your data pretty well um, and better than you would do if you solve the, those static inverse problems one by one.
And the last one is the Smiley data set, um, which is, for example, you have is the data set that I showed in the beginning. If you solve the if you solve the static inverse problem, then you'll get at different time steps, you'll get something which is uh, meaningless, basically, will not give you information what, what your data are. And then, but if you solve the dynamic inverse problem, here we compare two of the techniques, which is the anisotropic total variation and the isotropic 3D total variation, uh, then you see a very good uh, improvement over here. Um, in the next example, what we do is um, we we change the, the number of angles basically, and by changing the number of angles, then uh, of course uh, we assume that the quality will, will increase. Another thing that we do here is actually we impose non-negativity in our solution, and this can be done. Uh, we only show an example, but uh, for future work, we will consider um, uh, seeing how one can improve the quality by, by imposing non-negativity. So to, to, to uh, give a conclusion over here, uh, we propose those six different methods uh, provide solutions that have edges preserved. We have different applications. Uh, there are uh, some future directions, actually, potential future directions, so imposing non-negativity, uh, uh, quantifying the uncertainties for those, uh, for those techniques. And then another thing that, that is very interesting is uh, doing higher dimensional implementation to preserve the structure. So we started by those tensors, and I showed a little bit where I have formulations, but still, when we solve the problem, we go to the vectorization. Would be, would, it would be very nice to, to see in uh, um, like how preserving the structure through tensors will help um, will help with the quality of the reconstructions that you get. So just a, a short note, we have a, a version of our manuscript in, in archive, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for the attention there. Time, I would welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Marika. Um, we are a little past in time, so I think perhaps in the break we can use it to make some questions if you agree. Yeah, okay. yeah sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now it's time for our next speaker. We are two minutes past, so Erika, I don't know if you want to try. Hola. <laughs> ¿Qué tal? Buena. Hola. Eh, comparto, ¿no? Yes. Ahí está, no sé si ustedes lo pueden ver. Sí, sí. sí. Eh. Ahí estamos. Great. Perfecto, no sé. Ok, no sé, no sé. No, 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 te presento en inglés. Sí. <risa> Um, you are all right with recording, Erika. Erika, ¿estás de acuerdo con que eh, grabemos? Sí. Oh, sí. Okay. Right. <laughs> so our next talk, is, our next speaker is going to be Erika Porten. She's going to present her work titled "Inversion from a Random Sampling of the Radon Transform in the Context of SDA Groups." She is from the uh, University of San Martin in Argentina. This is a joint work together with Marcela Morbidone from the University of San Martin in Argentina and Juan Miguel Medina from the University of Buenos Aires from Argentina. So, Juan Mequeras. Muy bien, muchas gracias Mariela por la presentación. Bueno, este trabajo lo realizamos junto con mis directores de, de tesis en el contexto de, de, de mi doctorado. Eh, en, nosotros consideramos eh, el problema de reconstruir una función medible sobre un grupo G a partir de un conjunto eh, numerable de, de muestras eh, tomadas de manera aleatoria. El, el, las muestras eh, van, vamos a tomarlas a partir de un proceso puntual de Poisson, eh, donde G es un grupo abeliano localmente compacto. Eh, en el paso de la interpolación, eh, lo que pro propusimos fue un método iterativo que va haciendo un, un remuestreo en cada iteración y eh, presentaremos eh, estimaciones de los errores eh, obtenidos por la aproximación que, que obtenemos, eh, obtenida. Y, y luego aplicaremos estos, estos resultados al problema de aproximar eh, la inversa de la transformada de Radón de una, de una función. 
y finalmente eh, mostraremos algunas, algunos ejemplos numéricos eh, de, las sim de, de simulaciones. Entonces, eh, el <coughs> un resultado muy importante en el análisis armónico y en el procesamiento de señales en el contexto del de el grupo R, es el teorema de, de Shannon, que lo que nos, nos provee son condiciones eh, suficientes para reconstruir una función de banda limitada eh, de, del espacio L2 de RD a partir de un conjunto uniforme de muestras. O sea, nos, lo que tenemos con el teorema de Whittaker, Kotelnikov y Shannon es que si tenemos una función definida en un espacio L2 de R2, de R a D, eh, y un conjunto S, que en este caso vendría a ser un, un cubo de dimensión D, eh, si consideramos una función en el conjunto de Paley Wiener de S, o sea, es decir, o sea, las funciones de banda limitada, o sea, las funciones que tienen su transformada soportada eh, dentro del conjunto S, podemos reconstruir la función F a partir de sus muestras, eh, la, la evaluación de la F en, en un conjunto discreto de, de puntos. Este, esta, este operador K es en realidad la antitransformada de la característica del conjunto S, que en el contexto de R es la, la, la función SYNC, función conocida. Este teorema entonces nos permite a partir de un muestreo aleatorio, un muestreo uniforme, reconstruir una función, y eh, la versión abstracta, eh, la versión sobre grupos eh, LCA, eh, está, es conocida, la, fue dada por Klubanek, eh, extendió est, est, la versión del teorema de Shannon a, a los grupos eh, abelianos localmente compactos, y tanto la versión, el teorema de Shannon como la versión abstracta de Klubanek eh, son ejemplos de muestreo uniforme. En la práctica esto significa que las, eh, las funciones son muestre, o sea, representan una señal y son muestreadas con eh, puntos que son equidistantes. En el contexto abstracto lo que estamos pensando es que estamos evaluando a nuestra función en un, conjunto, en un subconjunto, en un subgrupo discreto H de G. En, sin embargo, en muchas aplicaciones el muestreo uniforme no es el más adecuado, y entonces es interesante estudiar un muestreo en donde los puntos son elegidos de manera aleatoria. Eh, esto fue estudiado por, por varios autores, entre ellos Papoulis y Pillay, eh, estudiaron el caso en el que el muestreo de los puntos se, a, se realiza a partir de un proceso de Poisson. Eh, tanto los procesos de Poisson como las medidas aleatorias asociadas a estos procesos se pueden definir en, en conjuntos, eh, de me, en espacios de medida sigma finita. Nosotros vamos a considerar el espacio medible G, B sub G y MG, y ahora vamos a eh, definir, digamos, algo de notación, digamos, acá tengo los borelianos, lo que vamos a hacer es definir algunas, de, a, hacer algunas definiciones y, y, y marcar cuál va, ser, cuál va a ser la notación que vamos a utilizar. En este caso nosotros eh, definimos a G, es nuestro grupo lo, abeliano localmente compacto, que eh, es un grupo con la topología de Hausdorff, donde eh, la operación es la suma, la operación del grupo es la suma, B, B de U es la sigma álgebra de Borel asociada a U, y eh, en el grupo G lo que tenemos es una medida MG, que es la única, o sea, vamos a tomar la medida de Har, que es la única medida invariante por traslaciones, invariante respecto de la operación del grupo, eh, entonces M de G va a ser esta medida de Har en el grupo, y vamos a estudiar el espacio de funciones LP, que vamos a anotar con LP de G. 
En este contexto, en el contexto de grupos, también podemos definir la transformada de Fourier, o sea, si la F pertenece a L1 de G, definimos la transformada de Fourier a partir de integrar sobre el grupo respecto de esta medida de Har. Vamos a denotar por gamma al, espacio du al, al grupo dual de G, y de manera similar, en el, gru en el grupo gamma tenemos una medida de Har y una sigma álgebra de Borel asociada al grupo gamma. Y de la misma manera tenemos una, eh, una expresión para la antitransformada de, de Fourier en el, con, con la medida de Har definida sobre el grupo gamma. Eh, ejemplos clásicos del, de grupos abelianos localmente compactos, tenemos el espacio RD con la operación de suma, donde el dual puede estar representado por R, y eh, las evaluaciones del dual en X las podemos ver como la exponencial compleja. Y tanto la medida, de, la medida en G como la medida en gamma son las medidas, eh, la medida de Lebesgue en RD. Otro ejemplo es el ejemplo del toro, que en su caso dual son los enteros, y eh, en ese caso la medida en G es la medida de Lebesgue, y la medida en gamma es la medida de contar. Entonces, análogamente al caso RD, podemos definir para nuestro grupo un, el espacio de Paley Wiener, de la misma forma, con los F pertenecientes, ahora en este caso es L2 del grupo, tal que la, la transformada de Fourier está soportada eh, en un conjunto en medible de un subconjunto medible de, de gamma. Si, si la medida de S es, es finita, podemos definir este, este núcleo, este operador, que es la antitransformada de la característica, y eh, podemos definir un, nuestro, un operador que es la proyección ortogonal sobre el Paley Wiener, o sea, lo que hace este operador T sub S es proyectar de manera ortogonal las, las funciones en L2 de G sobre el espacio de Paley Wiener. Este operador, similar al del teorema de Shannon, en el contexto ahora de grupos, eh, lo que hace es, eso es un operador integral, <coughs> que en el caso de que F pertenezca al Paley Wiener, lo que tengo es eh, una expresión integral de la F. O sea, si F pertenece al Paley Wiener, entonces, por un lado, esta integral eh, representa a mi función, y por otro lado, por el teorema eh, que mencionamos anteriormente, existe un subgrupo H en G, de tal manera que tomando... Val, eh, tomando los elementos de H y evaluando, yo puedo reconstruir la función a partir de, un, de este muestreo regular. Entonces, lo que nosotros eh, queremos eh, realizar es algo, o sea, definir una, un operador integral, pero va a ser un operador estocástico que me permita reconstruir la función a partir de un muestreo aleatorio. Lo que vamos a querer hacer es para un determin una determinadas funciones eh, definir una integral estocástica. Entonces, en, eh, nos interesa definir una integral estocástica, y para eso necesitamos definir nuestro espacio de probabilidad, entonces tenemos omega p, nuestro espacio de probabilidad, dentro de nuestro espacio de probabilidad nos vamos a considerar el b sub 0, que son todos los subconjuntos de la sigma álgebra de Borel asociada a G, de medida finita, y para lambda mayor que cero vamos a tomar una medida de Poisson asociada a un proceso de Poisson. O sea, para un proceso de Poisson dado vamos a definir una medida de Poisson que lo que hace es medir los subconjuntos de, de este espacio a partir a partir de una variable aleatoria. O sea, en este caso lo que tenemos es que G es la sigma álgebra generada por la familia de variables aleatorias eh, definidas por la medida de los 
el, de los conjuntos de este B sub 0. O sea, esta familia de variables aleatorias gen, tiene, genera esta sigma álgebra. Y lo que yo tengo acá es una medida eh, de Poisson. O sea, a partir de un proceso de Poisson yo puedo definir una medida y esta medida la puedo definir de tal manera que la medida de un conjunto, o sea, la esperanza de la medida de un conjunto, sea lambda por la medida eh, en el grupo de ese conjunto A. Esencialmente lo que yo tengo acá es que lo que espero obtener de la medida de un conjunto es la cantidad de muestras que yo tomo en ese conjunto. O sea, esto que está acá me permite relacionar la cantidad de muestras que yo tomo en el conjunto a partir de ese proceso de Poisson. O sea, en principio, digamos, antes de realizar el experimento, antes de tomar el muestreo, no sé cuáles son las muestras que yo voy a tomar, y lo que espero es que esta sea la cantidad de muestras que tome en un determinado conjunto. Entonces, lo que vamos a hacer ahora es definir un espacio de funciones sobre el que vamos a definir nuestra integral estocástica, y la idea es, nosotros vamos a partir de una función determinística, vamos a realizar un muestreo aleatorio, y vamos a obtener una eh, variable aleatoria. Y con esa nueva variable aleatoria, lo que nosotros vamos a querer hacer es volver a muestrear. Entonces, lo que vamos a hacer en este caso, es definir nuestras funciones, ya en el espacio de probabilidad, ya con cierta aleatoriedad, nuestra f va a ser una f que va de omega por g, f por g medible, donde f va a ser una sigma álgebra, eh, una subsigma álgebra de la sigma álgebra a, independiente de la sigma álgebra que me generaba la medida de Poisson, a partir del, de, de, del muestreo. O sea, es, en esta sigma álgebra lo que voy a tener es la información que ya traía la función antes de empezar el muestreo. Entonces, tengo eh, mi espacio de funciones, y en este espacio de funciones, la norma LP la vamos a definir como la esperanza de la norma LP en el grupo G. ¿sí? O sea, lo que yo tengo acá es, esto es una variable aleatoria, y entonces lo que vamos a considerar como norma es la esperanza de esta norma. Entonces, en este espacio, que yo tengo F, el espacio producto F por G, vamos a definir rectangulitos y cómo medimos estos rectangulitos. O sea, para medir estos rectangulitos que tenemos acá, lo que vamos a hacer es, lo vamos a pensar como el producto de, de un, conjunto, un subconjunto de la sigma álgebra F y un subconjunto de la sigma álgebra B, y lo que vamos a hacer es simplemente multiplicar o sea, la medida de la F la vamos a considerar como la característica, y la medida del conjunto B lo vamos a realizar con esa medida de Poisson que definimos anteriormente. Entonces, si consideramos una F simple en, para estos rectangulitos, lo que estamos considerando es una función que sea constante en cada uno de estos rectangulitos, entonces la, la función es la suma de esta esto que está acá, de la característica de los rectangulitos, eso quiere decir que cuando evalúo, esto es constante en cada uno de los rectangulitos, y definimos, como se define clásicamente la integral, la integral estocástica respecto de esta medida, es la suma de los valores de la función por la medida de estos rectangulitos. Entonces, Acá tenemos esta integral estocástica, que es una variable, esto, variable aleatoria, y esto tiene las siguientes propiedades. Si yo tengo una función simple, la esperanza de esta integral estocástica resulta ser lambda por la integral de la esperanza de f respecto de la medida del grupo. Si observamos esto, eh, una cosa que podemos ver es que si la f es determinística, esta esperanza me termina dando la f, y por lo tanto, esta integral estocástica tiene como esperanza la integral clásica, digamos, la integral sobre el grupo. Entonces lo que tengo es un estimador, o sea, esta integral es un estimador de la integral eh, en, en el grupo. 
esta eh, definición de integral estocástica, acá la hicimos para un, una función simple, y mediante un proceso de límite se puede definir para cualquier función en el espacio L1 intersección L2. Acá eh, hice una pequeña demostración de el, la primera parte del lema. <coughs> la idea es, bueno, acá usé, digamos, tengo una función simple, acá usamos la definición de la integral, y usando propiedades de la esperanza, o sea, la linealidad y el hecho de que la medida de los rectangulitos tiene esta pinta, y estas son dos variables aleatorias que son independientes, y por lo tanto la esperanza del producto es el producto de las esperanzas, además teníamos que la esperanza de B sub i era lambda por la medida de B sub i, y usando esa información logramos llegar a lambda por la integral de la esperanza de, de F. Entonces, como decíamos, comentaba anteriormente, si la F es determinística, lo que tengo es que la esperanza de esta integral resulta ser la integral sobre el grupo. Entonces, la idea es eh, definir un operador similar al anterior, fíjense que en este caso me quedó que la esperanza de la integral estocástica es lambda por la, por la integral en el grupo, entonces lo que vamos a definir es un operador que es 1 sobre lambda por la integral sobre el grupo, en este caso estocástica. Esta sería como la versión estocástica del operador T sub S. <coughs> si usamos el lema anterior, lo que podemos ver es que la esperanza de este operador es la función F, y entonces este es un estimador de mi F. ¿Sí? Es una variable aleatoria que me permite estimar la F. Por lo tanto, la esperanza sería la función más cercana a la función que yo quiero reconstruir. En este caso lo que hacemos es definir sobre qué conjuntos está definida esta integral. O sea, lo que tenemos es, primero, eh, subsigma álgebras g sub n independientes de a, en donde lo que voy a tener para cada g sub n, voy a tener una medida asociada al proceso de Poisson. O sea, esta medida está asociada al muestreo que yo hago. O sea, el muestreo aleatorio va a definir esta medida y voy a tener una, una sucesión de sigma álgebras f sub n, en donde voy a tener la información de los muestreos anteriores. Donde lo que voy a tener es fn, es la sigma álgebra generada por la g sub i que usé hasta acá. Entonces cada vez que hago un muestreo aparece una nueva variable, una nueva medida n sub n, y la información me queda guardada dentro de este, de este espacio. Entonces, para f perteneciente a, a, a L2 de fn-1, puedo definir este operador, y lo que podemos ver es que este operador cae en el espacio L2 de fn, y pertenece o sea, a, al palais Wiener de S, de manera casi segura, digamos, con probabilidad 1. ¿Bien? La probabilidad de que este operador caiga en el palay binar es 1. Y con esta definición lo que podemos ver es que la esperanza de esta diferencia, en este caso yo tengo acá la diferencia del operador eh, evaluado en una función g, multiplicado por un factor de relajamiento, y estoy mirando la diferencia que hay entre F y este operador. Esta diferencia, la esperanza de la, de la norma de esta diferencia, la puedo, se puede probar que está relacionada con la, la esperanza de la norma, en este caso de T sub S, que es, sería la integral en, sobre el grupo G, con la medida de G, más un factorcito que depende de la esperanza de, de, la, de la norma de, de G. En este caso lo que podemos ver es que, por un lado es que si F, si G es la función F, como T sub S eh, era la proyección ortogonal sobre el palais Wiener, 
TSVCD F sería como la proyección sobre el Palais Wiener de la F. Si F pertenece al Palais Wiener, TSVCD F coincide con F. Y en el caso de que gamma sea 1, este término desaparece. Entonces, en el caso de tomar que F sea igual a G y la, y la F en el Palais Wiener, con gamma igual a 1, lo que podemos ver es que la esperanza de esta diferencia solo tiene el, el término que, que tenemos acá. Entonces, si observamos esto que está acá, una cosa de la que podemos ver es que tomando lambda tendiendo a infinito, lo que podemos hacer es que esta diferencia tienda a cero en probabilidad. Entonces lo que obtenemos es que este estimador de la F eh, es, o sea, es un buen estimador de mi función F. ¿sí? Nuestro, nuestro estimador. Eh. Ahora, el problema que tenemos es que para que sea una buena aproximación de la F, el lambda que tengo que tomar tiene que ser eh, muy grande. ¿sí? Para lambda grande esto tiende a cero, pero necesito o sea, tomar lambda demasiado grande. Entonces, un resultado que mejora, eh, este, o sea, que mejora esto es aplicar el método iterativo. ¿Está bien? Entonces proponemos un método iterativo que, eh, que mejora este resultado, y el método iterativo básicamente lo que hace es empieza con una función cero, y lo que hace es como ajustar la estimación. Lo que hago es tomar la función que tenía en el paso anterior y le sumo algún factor de la corrección de la diferencia. Lo que hago es estimar la diferencia entre lo que yo encontré y, lo, y la función a la que, que yo quiero estimar. Entonces, Eric, sí. Disculpa sí. que te interrumpe. Estamos más o menos en tiempo, si te parece, no sé, tomarte unos Bien. Tres, tres minutitos, no sé si conoces. Bien, bueno, te voy un poco más rápido. Entonces, <risa> eh, con, e, bueno, con este método iterativo lo que pudimos mostrar es que esta esperanza de la diferencia está acotada por esto, y por lo tanto tiende a cero de manera exponencial. Entonces, este es un mejor estimador, o sea, fn es un mejor estimador de la función. Bueno, acá tenía la demostración. La idea era usarlo en la transformada de Radón. O sea, lo que idealmente una máquina tomográfica lo que hace es tomar una muestra de la transformada de Radón, con lo cual invirtiendo la transformada de Radón, lo que hacemos es reconstruir la función original. Entonces, nos, lo que nosotros intentamos hacer es aplicar este método iterativo a la transformada de Radón, reconstruir la transformada de Radón de manera iterativa, y entonces a partir de una muestra aleatoria conseguir una muestra eh, uniforme de la transformada de Radón, y invirtiendo la transformada de Radón, recuperar la función original. O sea, acá lo que tenemos es un teorema que me permite como escribir una aproximación de, de la función, o sea, lo que, lo que tenemos es una versión suavizada de la función, y eh, mirando, es, o sea, usando eso, lo que tenemos es el siguiente teorema. Si yo tomo f como la transformada de Radón, y le hago este método iterativo a la transformada de Radón, lo que hago es reconstruir la transformada de Radón, cuando aplico este operador, que me, permit, me permitía recuperar la versión suavizada, lo que obtengo es un buen estimador de una buena aproximación de la versión suavizada. ¿Está bien? Acá lo que estoy usando es el teorema anterior. De la misma manera puedo probar esta cota que también tiende exponencialmente a cero. Después lo que hicimos fue alguna, una simulación numérica, lo que tenemos acá en realidad es la, versión suav, la imagen suavizada, y nosotros tomamos una eh, muestra de la transformada de Radón de la imagen original. Sobre esta muestra lo que hicimos es quedarnos con una, tomar una muestra aleatoria a partir de un proceso de Poisson y reconstruir el sinograma de la transformada. Y a partir de esto, invirtiendo, reconstruimos la imagen. O sea, lo que tenemos es una reconstrucción de la imagen suavizada. Entonces este es eh, un ejemplo numérico, 
acá lo que hicimos fue proponerlo con distintas iteraciones, con una, con cinco, con diez y con quince iteraciones, y lo que vamos viendo es que mejora. Acá lo que hicimos fue tomar un 5% de muestras, y en el siguiente ejemplo lo que tenemos es, en la parte de arriba tenemos con una iteración, tomando un 5% de muestras contra un 50% de muestras. En, este, en la primera iteración la diferencia es muy grande, pero en, una, en 15 iteraciones eh, no hay gran diferencia y lo que tengo es una buena reconstrucción con una cantidad de muestras significativamente menor que si hubiera tomado un muestreo con muchas muestras. Bueno, me faltó la, la, de, la diapositiva de muchas gracias. Creo que aceleré. Sí, sí, aceleraste. Muchísimas gracias, Erika. Llegamos 17 llegué, minutos. Llegué. Perfecto. Entonces, ahora podríamos, si hay alguien que tiene ganas de hacer alguna pregunta, someone wants to make any question, any comment on this job. En todo caso, tenemos el espacio del networking también para... Eh, But we are just we are in time of the break, so we can leave the, the questions or comments for the ah, okay. I don't know if, what do you think? Okay, it's perhaps in this in this talk or for the speaker, if someone has any question, we can do it now and then in the previous speakers we can do it in the networking. Okay. <laughs> any comment, any question? Ah, you're there. <laughs> okay, I can stop recording.